Well, good morning and welcome to the Vineyard Church of God once again. Great to have you here. Great to have you watching and those that are here in the congregation. Uh, if you're watching the video, if you can, just give us a comment below. Uh, give us a thumbs up. And if you want to leave a prayer request or a praise report, because uh, we always like bragging on God, go ahead and write it in the comment section below. And if you don't want it known, go to thevineyardcog.com and go to the contact us page. When you go to the contact us page, just write in what, you, uh, what you're requesting or your praise reports. And we'll go ahead and pray for them on Wednesday night at our, our prayer group. Uh, because this is a house of prayer, and we believe that prayer works. Um, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, we come together where two or more are gathered in his name. He is there in the midst of us. We know that he hears the prayers. We know that, uh, that he, he touches people, he heals people, because we've seen testimonies, we've heard testimonies, actually seen it live, seen him, him in action. He does hear our prayers. So if you could do that for us, uh, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, uh, press the subscribe button. That way you'll get instant notifications when we have our videos coming out. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about following good examples. Because how many of you know we don't want to follow the bad examples, you know, for people that are setting a bad example towards us or to other people. We want good to flow through us to other people. That way good goes into them and flows out to other people that they meet. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer first. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning that you've given us to be able to get out of bed alive and breathing, Father God, your air to be able to see your beauty when we go outside, whether it be snow, whether it be rain, whether it be sunshine, spring, summer, winter, or fall, we see your hand in everything that we see. And we thank you for it, Lord. We ask that you watch over us today, and that, Father God, especially for me, that it not be my word that I'm speaking, but your word, Father God. That way they hear your words directly into them, and they instill it in their hearts. That way they can share it with all those that they meet. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to be reading out of the third John. We're going to be going from verses 1 through 11. Now, it's, it's a funny thing about the, the Word of God. All the chapters in the Bible, um, all the words of God, uh, but there are small books. There are small books in the Bible, and a lot of time they go unnoticed. Uh, Adam Clark wrote this on the shorter books of the Bible. He said, But it has been the lot, both of minor prophets and the minor epistles, to be generally neglected, for with many readers, bulk is everything, and no magnitude, no goodness. So in other words, people, a lot of people think that if it doesn't have a lot, if it's not a thick book, then it doesn't have anything worth reading because it's not that much. Okay, people like big books. Okay, but here we're talking about one chapter. This is uh, 3 John. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 11 from the very beginning of it. Uh, let's go ahead and start with verse 1 through 4. Now, I like the way he starts out his letters. All these, these apostles, when they write their letters to these people, the beginning of the letter, the opening of the letter, that's what sets the mood. That, that's what brings us into the posture of whoever it is that's writing. I don't know if you've ever wrote a letter to anybody or not, but I always used to, you know, I always like writing a letter with a nice opening in it that blesses the person. So this is the way that, that John is um, writing to Gaius. He says, the elder, okay, he is the elder. He's not saying his name for a reason because of everything that was going on. It was probably best not to say who was writing the letter. You know, with everything that was going on with uh, people coming against the apostles and attacking them, 
Um, so he just wrote down the elder, and they know who he was. It says, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. His children, the ones that he has been discipling, walking in truth. If you have never had a class of little kids, you know, I started out with as a children's pastor, and some of those I still see on Facebook. Of course, they're not kids anymore. They're grown up with families of children, children that are grown up and having grandchildren for them, okay? So I see this, and I see that they are still walking with the Lord. They're still in church. They're still ministering to people, you know, whether it be playing music or teaching or sound ministry, whatever it is. And it just lifts you up knowing that they were little kids in your kids' church and they're grown up and they're following the Lord still. So I can see what John is talking about when it comes to Gaius. He's just, he, he feels blessed, you know, because of the way that he has turned out, the way that he is presenting himself to other people. The writer of this book identifies himself as simply the elder, though. Presumably, the first readers knew who this was. This was John, okay? The same one that wrote the big, you know, gospel, John. And from the earliest times, Christians have understood that this was the Apostle John writing, the same John who wrote the gospel of John, 1 and 2 John, and the book of Revelation. They knew that this was him, so it's okay. You put down the elder, hey, they know they know who you are. Verses two and four. Now this is a blessing for, for faithful Gaius, and he calls him faithful. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, in all things. Okay, that's the way he is talking about his beloved Gaius. Okay, the word for prosper literally means to have a good journey. It metaphorically means to succeed or prosper. It's like saying, I hope things go well for you. As you travel on your way, as you go working in your ministry, I hope things go well for you, that you are prosperous. Amen? I'd love to hear that. Just as your soul prospers, when he says this, John here made an analogy between the condition of our health and the condition of our soul. Okay, just think about this. If your soul is in the same condition of your health, where would you stand? Okay, many Christians would be desperately ill if their physical health was instantly in the same state as their spiritual health. Because even though some people think they're just, that their spiritual health is, you know, it's healthy. I'm, I'm doing real good. Okay, I'm feeling great. Even though you may think that, it may not be that way if you put it into the physical health perspective. Now, when he says to walk in truth, uh, I know we've heard this, we've heard this a lot, you know, that we are to walk in truth. What is the truth? Well, we know that it is it's the opposite of lying. You know, it, it's the truth. But it means to walk in consistent with the truth you believe okay it's all in the mindset okay if you believe that you are fallen then walk weary of your fallenness if you believe you are a child of god then walk like a child of heaven if you believe you are forgiven then walk like a forgiven person we have to walk the walk that we talk okay if you say you are, act like it, walk like it. If you say you're a Christian, then walk like a Christian. Amen? To walk in truth means to walk in a way that is real and genuine without any phoniness or concealment. I'm not hiding anything. This is who I am. This is the real me. I'm not being phony. I'm not putting on a mask on Sunday 
This is who I am. This is the way that I talk to other people. If they have questions about, uh, you know, God, religion, you know, where I stand with, with the Bible and things like that, I'm going to give them the truth. And that's why I believe people like coming to me and asking me questions about it and asking for my help. And, and I enjoy it. I love it. Um, verses 5 through 8. This is learning from good and bad examples. Now we're getting into the meat of things where we are learning from first a good example, which is Gaius. Gaius is a good example of what we need to act like. Okay, The way that he talked to other people, the way that he passed himself off to other people, the way that he led other people, that was truth. Okay, So he's, he's leading a good example. It says, starting in verse 5, going through 8, he says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren, brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. We have to walk the walk. We have to talk the walk or talk the talk. If we are Christians, if we are God-fearing believers, if we love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, then we need to show that. We need to show that to everybody. Now, when he said, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers, we do that too. We go out and we're nice to people. We call it being nice to people. It's showing hospitality. Well, John praised Gaius for his hospitality. This may seem somewhat trivial to us because it's nothing for us to be nice to people. But it is not to God. This is a practical outworking of the essential command to love one another. It is love in action. Remember, love one another as you love yourself. We have to spread that love. And the way we spread the love is through our hospitality. It's sharing with other people. Not only just Christians, but our next door neighbors. For those that, that are out in, in this world and they're walking around lost and they're, and they're thinking that nobody loves them, that there's no hope, that there's no joy left in the world, and that everybody's coming against them, we can show our love to them and support. Amen. We're a big family. We're the family of God. And there's a lot of us to show love and support. This was a great compliment where he says, you do faithfully whatever you do. Whatever God gives us to do, we should do it faithfully. Think about that. We should do it faithfully. Jesus said that when we see him face to face, some will hear the words, and this comes out of Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Of the good servant, it said that he was faithful. That's what John is saying to Gaius. You're faithful. Amen. We need to have that. I have a motto that I, that I follow in my Christian walk all the time. It was from when I was a, a baby Christian, first starting out. I seen this on the wall of the church, and it always stuck with me. And I had to keep thinking about it. It said, excellence in all things, all things to the glory of God. What does it mean? To be excellent in every single thing we do and do it as if you're doing it for God himself. Give him your best, your first fruits. Everything belongs to God. So give it your best. So excellence in all things, all things to the glory of God. Where he says, send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God. In that day, Christian travelers in general and internet or <laughs> itinerant ministers in particular were greatly dependent upon the hospitality of other Christians. Excuse me, getting tongue-tied here. 
John knew that when Christians assist those who contend for the truth, they become fellow workers for the truth. It's the way that we approach each other. It's our hospitality that we show each other that gives the hope, that gives peace, that gives joy, that brings them closer to the Lord who gives grace. He gives mercy. It brings them closer to Jesus, our Redeemer of our sins, our Savior. When we do that, they get that instilled in their hearts and in their lives, and they share the goodness and the love with other people. Could you imagine if that caught on like this virus is? If that caught on, the love of God and treating other people with respect and kindness and joy, sharing what you've got inside of you, being faithful to God, what a world this would be. But they become workers for the truth. And I like that. The reward for these support people now we have support people in this in this battle, this this war zone I, I call it, of the world. Okay, so let let's put it in in a perspective we can all understand. The reward for these support people is the same as those who are out on the front lines. Okay, in First Samuel chapter thirty verses 20, 21 through twenty five, it shows this principle where the spoils are distributed equally among those who fought and those who supported King David understood that the supply lines were just as vital as the soldiers and God would reward both soldiers and supporters properly and generously. We can put that in the nowadays because we have missionaries, we have evangelists, we have pastors going out into spiritual war zones in this world. It's our missions field. When we leave this property, it's the missions field. It's the world. Amen. But we cannot forget those who support the leaders, the lady, lay leaders of the church, the ministry leaders, those in the helps ministry, all supporting the frontline soldiers of the Lord. Everybody that stays behind, okay, they're still going to get blessings. All right, it's for everybody. So where it said that, where it said, you know, and God would reward both soldiers and supporters properly and generously, each one's as to their works, what they have done for the missions, for their pastors, for the ministries of God. In a manner worthy of God, where he says that in here, Christians are not only called to help, but to help in a manner worthy of God. It's not just something that we do to, to you know, pick someone up because they're behind on a bill or, or they need food in their house, so we, we take them some food. You know, it's not something, you know, little and stuff like that. We can do that. Everybody can do that. The, the world can do that. But can they do it in a manner worthy of God? Can they do it as a shared blessing? As God blesses us, we bless others. We are to do our best to help others excellently. Excellence in all things, all things to the glory of God. Christians must first see that they are doing something to help the spread of the gospel. We can't just be pew warmers. We can't be seat warmers. We can't just stay in here in our own four walls and, and help ourselves. We have to go out and spread it to the world. If, if you're in your living room and that's all you ever do is just sit there in your living room and, and watch the, the, the church videos and things like that, get out into the world, out of your four walls. When you hear God's message, and it gets instilled in your heart. Tell other people. Tell other people. I wish that this virus would never have come along. Because it has, to me, tore apart the church. It has been a main target that the devil has had to tear the church apart. Where buildings used to be full, 
praising and worshiping the Lord and fellowshipping together as Christians and getting strong together, supporting each other together face to face, loving each other. Instead of that, we love at a distance. We, we love in a virtual world. And that's not the same as here in the congregation face to face. It could never be the same as that. We need to have companionship. We need to have fellowship with fellow Christians that are strong in the Lord to keep us built up. Did you know that that affects your immune system as well? If you're locked up and your body's locked up inside of a room and you're afraid to go out, that fear that is inside you it causes anxiety. Anxiety causes stress. Stress, you know, it, it's a body killer. You know, heart problems, you know, and you're just sitting there. You need to get out. You need to get out. So I, I, I ask each and every one of you, if you're a lock-in and you have to be there because of health problems, I pray blessings upon you. I pray health upon you. But talk to somebody, have someone come over, have someone speak to you, a fellow Christian, strong in the Lord. And if there is nothing wrong, if it's just fear that's holding you back, go to the house of God. If you have to wear a mask or something, wear it. You know, usually I don't even get into this, but it's just something that the Lord has put on my heart. Don't fear. God is not the author of fear. The devil is the author of fear, anxiety, despair. He's the one that is destroying the church. He's the one that is coming against all the Christians. He's the one that is separating. Don't give the devil his due. Don't show him that he can steal your joy. Amen. I'll get back to this now. We must first see that they are doing something to help spread the gospel. They must see that they do it in a manner worthy of God. God calls everyone of us to have a part in the Great Commission. If you don't know what the Great Commission is, here it is in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One can have a part by going or having a part by helping, but everyone has a part and should do it well. If you're not the minister doing it in, in the front line, be a supporter. Support your pastor. Support your church. Support the ministry of God. And here we go. We're going to go to uh, a man named Diotrephes. He's a bad example. In verses 9 through 11, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate, imitate, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. God can't look upon the evil. He can't have any part of it. But Diotrephes, John publicly rebuked this man and rebuked him by, by name. He named him out. In rebuking him by name, the apostles of love or the apostle of love, John did not act outside of love. Instead, he followed the clear command of the scriptures. In Romans 16, 17, verse 17 says this. Now I urge you, brethren, note these who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them 
and the example of their apostles. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. These people that are evil, causing evil against the called ministers of God, these evangelists, these apostles, okay, these disciples, he is causing them, you know, e evil is causing them to come against them and to speak evil against them. Now it says, he who loves, or who loves to have the preeminence among them. Simply the problem for Diotrephes was pride. Pride, the number one thing. You know, I, I'm jealous. It, it's pride. I've got to have it better. Okay, I've got to be better than this person. In his pride, he did not receive the apostles, such as John. This was in contrast to the humble hospitality of Gaius, who walked in truth, okay? Total opposites, where he says, he who, who loves to have the preeminence among them. Simply the problem for Diotrephes was pride. In his pride, he did not receive the apostles such as John, which I said that, okay? This is in contrast to the humble hospitality of guys who walked in truth. We can imagine, okay, just imagine this, a man like Diotrephes today, today. Imagine this. A leader in the church in some city looking at John and saying to himself, why should these big shot apostles get all the attention and honor? Look at my ministry. Isn't it just as good? And pride would lead him like many others to destruction. You ever hear that pride comes before the fall? There are those out there that want to be better than the Joneses. They want to have more, better for people to look at them and say, oh, how great thou art. When it's not supposed to be that way, it's supposed to be how great God is. It's all God. It is not man. It is God. And that's who we need to focus on. Everything we are, everything that we do, everything that we have is of God. Everything. Everything. And nobody can say anything otherwise. They can't say, well, I worked hard for this. It's from me. No, you didn't create it. God created you and gave you the mind. He gave you the breath. He gave you the abilities, the talents to do whatever it is you got. He's the one that allowed you to get what you have. And the way that you treat it is the way that you are going to be looked at. The way that you treat God is the way that other people are going to be seeing you. Amen? <clears throat> so we can't do this. We can't act that way. All right. Whew. I tell you, pride comes before the fall, and I've seen it before. Praying against us with malicious words. In our churches, we see this. We see this from the top to the bottom. In, in, in different ways. And there are those righteous remnants that God has of churches that are faithful to him. And I believe that we are one of those churches that are faithful to him, believing in him, having faith in him and trusting him and him alone. But praying against us with malicious words, Diotrephes not only failed to receive John and the other apostles, but he also spoke against him. His malicious gossip against the apostles showed what kind of man he really was. If you can publicly announce that, you're not a pastor. You're not my pastor. You're not a man of God. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit. What are you doing here in my church? If you can say something like that, just think about it. what kind of person are you? Are you a Gaius or are you, uh, you know, <laughs> the other bad guy here, Diotrephes? Which one? 
putting them out of the church. He did. He put them out of the church. Diotrephes not only used his influence to forbid others from showing hospitality to John or his associates. You know how that works. You put a bug in someone's ear and tell them, you know, you, you really don't want to listen to this guy. You know, if you do, bad things are going to happen to you. So you don't want to go to that church. You don't want to listen to him because he's not holy. He's not a pastor. It's those kind of people that put bugs in other people's ears and spread rumors. Diotrephes was not a good guy. He even tried to excommunicate those who tried to show hospitalities. The example of Diotrephes shows that those who love to have the preeminence also love to use whatever power they think they have as a sword against others. God has a sword. It's his word. It's the sword of truth. And if anyone stands up against God's word as not being true, then they don't know God. I'm going to close it with this, where he says, Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. John gave us two clear examples, one good, Gaius, and one bad, Diotrephes. And he now applies the point, follow the good, for we serve a good God, and those who follow him will likewise do good. Good begets good. Evil begets evil. I want the good to beget good. I don't know about you, but I'd like to share joy in this joyless world. I'd like to share peace with those who just don't seem to have any more peace. They can't find it in it, in the chaos. The devil has created a, a massive chaos and has begun to get to people and to test their faithfulness to God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, be faithful to God. If you find yourself stumbling back because the devil keeps putting it in your mind, turn to God's word. Look at it. Read it. Don't go all the way back to the beginning. Don't go through the Old Testament. Go to the New Testament, the good news of Jesus. Amen. I don't want to see anybody lost in this world. That's not an option. We need to love each other. We need to spread joy. We need to spread hope. We need to spread Jesus. We need to spread God. We need to spread Holy Spirit. All three in one. Remember what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And second, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love being the key word, the most powerful word. Love. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word today. If I have fallen to the right or to the left, Father God, I apologize for getting off your word, but it's a very touchy subject. And I think everybody is living it right now. Everybody is seeing it right now. And they're looking at the Christians and they're asking questions. Is that the way that Christians act? Is that the way that Christians live? We need to step up as Christians. We need to have true faith in the Lord. We need to have a true faith in you, Jesus. A new faith. In this year of 2022, we need to renew ourselves to you, Lord. We need to stand up and step up and stop taking a back seat to this world and the ruler of this world. We are children of God. 
We need to claim that. Strengthen our faith. Show us the truth. We ask this in your mighty name that you watch over us as we head out into the missions field today. As we come off our properties, out of our houses, wherever it is we're at listening to this, Father God, it's the missions field when we head out into the world. I ask for your hedge of protection to be around each and every one of us, our families, our vehicles, our properties, our businesses, that Lord, wherever fiery darts are shot at us, that they are quenched with the shield of faith. That knowing that you are before us, no one can be against us. We thank you, Father God. In your mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray this prayer. Amen and amen. And we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for joining us. Amen. Have a joyous day.